You know, I had a great opportunity this past week. My oldest daughter, Lydia, who was up here on stage, she's sitting here in the front row. She's in college at, at SEMO, and she had an economics test coming up this past week. And she called me up, which I love it when she calls me, but she called me up and she's like, Dad, uh, I need, she don't call me Daddy, she calls me Daddy. She goes, Daddy, I need some help studying for this economics test. And I'm like, awesome, that sounds great. So we met up and we're, we're studying this, e- this e- economics. And at first, I could feel it on her when we first sat down that she's nervous. She's nervous. Like, this test is coming up. I know you know more about it than I do. Please help me. Can you pull that out of your brain somehow and insert it? Can you download it into my brain? And, but as we talked through it, she started getting a little more comfortable with it. She started feeling more confident. You can feel the confidence. Has anybody ever been there before where, if you think back when you were in school, where you had to take a test, and if you're just going to be honest right now, be honest, shame the devil right now, like you did not prepare. I mean, you, you didn't prepare, maybe not at all. Like you, you, you really didn't. You went to take the test, and you're just like, this is not going to be good. Like this is, this is not going to be good. Like I, I, I'm here. I probably shouldn't have even showed up. Or maybe I'll just write an F real big on the top and hand it back and just say, well, just, I'm just going to waste your time and not going to waste my time. Let's just get this over with. Anybody ever been, you know what I'm talking about? But how many of you, though, have prepared? Like you really studied, you prepared way in advance, and it's something you know about, and you sit down, and the test comes out, and you're like, I got this. You know what I'm saying? Right? And so I was so awesome to sit here and, you know, get to work with her and see her confidence go up as she's starting to understand these things so she can go into this test. But it made me think about, as Christians, as we follow Jesus, I hope you all know this, when you follow Jesus, the Lord is going to give you a series of tests as you walk with him. And why is that? Well, the purpose of a test is to, for you to show that you understand something, that you've learned something, that you're growing. That's the, that's the point of the test, Right? That's how you pass a test. If you flunk the test, you don't understand it. And when you're following Jesus, if you flunk the test, you're going to go back and take it again. But see, he wants us to pass the test, and we give a series of tests. And when God's given his test, let me tell you, he is testing your heart, right? Because God knows if your heart doesn't change, nothing else is going to change, right? But ultimately, what he wants to do is change your heart, come in and change your heart to look more like Jesus. So therefore, the next thing to get your hand to change, it has to be through your time, your talent, and your treasure. Those are the three areas that God wants to change your hand. To To be a follower of Jesus and be the hands and feet of Jesus, you have to be willing to be extremely generous with your time, your talent, and your treasure. Now notice... That was not a menu that you could choose one or the other. It's a list, all-inclusive. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I give my time, I give my talent, and I give my treasure. We have too many Christians today that say, I'll do the first two. I ain't doing the third one. Ooh, we got quiet real fast. But see, God calls us to say, oh, Lord, my time, my talent, and treasure, it's all yours. Even my treasure. Let me put you this way. Did you know that every time you get paid, it's a test? Every time you get paid or you receive income, it is a test. Why? Because the test is this. When you, you think about the last time you got paid. Some of you get paid monthly, some twice a month, some every week, whatever it is you get paid. Where does the first part of your money go to? When the money comes in, where does it go first? Visa? MasterCard? Vacation? Myself? My hobbies? And so whatever your money goes to first, that's what you worship the most. And so it's a test. Time, talent, and treasure. And so I can already feel it. I can feel it in the room. I can already feel it. Some of you are not happy right now. Some of you are not, I can't believe I came to church today. He's going to talk about tithing. I I know I should have stayed home this morning, man. So if that's you today, this message is for you. Okay? Because usually when we talk about money, the ones that are stingy with their money get like, oh, man, I don't know, because it's my money. Is it? 
It's time, talent, and treasure. And you can tell you something, all of those are God's. They're not yours. And the reason why some of you get offended and you get upset and you're angry right now, because some of you look angry as I look at you, that I'm, I'm talking about money, it's because you are deceived. The enemy has deceived you into thinking that it's your money and that how dare you talk about my money, right? And so the enemy, what, remember, y'all remember the beta Satan, what the enemy does, he wants to take something that's a godly principle and pervert it and give you a counterfeit. What's the counterfeit when it comes to money? He, instead of it being God's, it's yours. And God would never want you to have any more. You got to take care of your money. You got to get yours because God can't take care of you. He can't. Oh, no. He's, he's too busy. He's got so many other things. Mm. So today, what I want to look at as this test, because God gives us a test when it comes to money, and then I want to look at how we're going to pass the test. Because don't you want to pass the test? You don't want to take a test again, do you? Right? No, I don't either. So if you've got your Bibles out, go to Malachi. And if you're like, where in the world is that at? Okay, go to the New Testament. If you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you find Matthew, just go over to the Old Testament like a few pages, and you'll find it real fast, okay? So go to Malachi chapter 3, a pretty popular passage when it talks about money and tithing and giving, and I want to break it down for you. So why don't you just go there, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I got it up here on the screen. For I am the Lord, this is God talking, I do not change. Now, this is very important. God is saying, I never change, ever. Never have, never will. From everlasting to everlasting. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the same. Therefore, if God never changes, his principles never change. All right, before I go back there and do the next one, let's say it one more time. Because this is really important. If you miss this, you're going to miss the rest of the sermon. Okay, here we go. God doesn't change. So his principles never, okay, I'm proud of you. You get a gold star. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. You have. God didn't go away. You went away from his ordinances and you haven't kept them. Now, what's an ordinance? You need to understand an ordinance is a principle of ordinary behavior. That's what an ordinance is. That's why we have city ordinances, right? Right? And you're probably happy that we have some of those to stop things that shouldn't be happening from happening. How many of you are kind of happy or at least a little bit happy that we have noise ordinances in, 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 in town? Right? Come on, somebody. Jeez Louise. But it's, it's a principle of ordinary behavior. So what is God saying? Don't miss this. He's saying, my ordinance He's saying tithing is an ordinance that should be normal for my children. Let me say it over here. I I don't know if y'all like that. Tithing, an ordinance from God, should be normal behavior of his children. That's what he's saying. But he's saying, oh, but you, you ran away from it. You turned from it. Mm, Here we go, verse 7. Return to me, and I'll return to you. So he's saying, I'm not leaving you, even though you've turned away from me and you're not doing what I told you to do. He didn't say, good luck. He said, no, but if you'll return to me, I'll return to you. Because how do you expect God to get you the resources you need that he's called you to do if you're running away from him? He's saying, return back, and I will resource you with whatever it is that you need that I've called you to do says the Lord of hosts, but you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? God says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, meaning you cursed yourself. I didn't curse you. For you have robbed me Even the whole nation. Now pause. He said, God said multiple times there, you have robbed me. You have robbed me. Now, can you physically rob God? No. He owns everything, right? But what what is God saying? God's saying you have robbed me from the opportunity to bless you. 
That's what you're robbed. God wants to bless you, but he's saying, you have robbed me. Now, notice the, there's the word rob. It's not steal. They're two different words. Stealing is when you're sneaky and you take something from somebody. Robbing is when you're right, you, you're right in front of them and you take it from them. So God's saying, it's not even that you're sneaky. You know this. You know I'm calling you to give and be generous and tithe. But yet you rob me right in front of my face. You rob me. So how do we stop robbing God? Verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring. What is he saying? Bring. He's saying return. Because it's not yours anyways. So when we bring it, we're bringing it back to where it originated. It's his. Return. Return the tithe back to the church, which is the storehouse, right? And why is that? Why does God say to you and me to return the tithe back to the church? It's because the government will not meet the needs of the people. I don't care what party you're with. It won't. The church is supposed to meet the needs of the people. So let me put it to you this way. Um, we have a budget here at the church. Hope you all know that. The budget, and I just actually uh, sent it in and got it approved for this coming year, 2023. But the budget is based on what we all return back to God. So what we return back to God, that's how we budget what we're going to do and what needs that we can meet. Now, hold that for a second. God brings people to a church. All of you are here and the first service, all the people that are here, we're all here. We're all a big part of church family. He brings us all here together because he has needs we're supposed to meet as a church, not only in here, but out there, both inside and outside. Guess what? He knows exactly all those needs, and he brings all of us in here because all the resources needed to meet those needs are right here. But do we meet all the needs that God calls us as a church to meet? No, we don't. No, we don't. There's so many things that God's put on my heart that I want to do, and I know some of you, Pastor Justin, we should go do this. And I go, you're right. We should. Should. But... The reason why we can't and we don't is because the tithes and offerings in many, for many people is still in their purse and their pocket. And you don't want to put it in God's hand. You'd rather put it in personal use is what you'd rather have, right? I always say this. There's something interesting about people with their money. Their, their hand, it, 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 it works really good out there. Like you get that debit card. So whoosh, ching, ching, ching. But then it comes in here and it's like, ah, it won't work. My hand won't work inside the church building. It's so weird. Bring the, all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. That's the why. Bring the tithes into the church. Why? That there may be food, spiritual food and physical food in my house. Why is he saying now, I don't know what you, if you guys would agree with me, but I believe we have really good food here. I believe we have great food that you can come, you can eat on this food, and you can grow spiritually. You can get equipped. Your family, you can bring friends, and they're going to hear the gospel. We've got great programs for all ages here for you to connect and grow in community. I believe we've got good food. And, but the problem is so many people want the good food. They want the filet. They want to come in and eat it, but they want to skip the check. Spiritually healthy churches, and they're all over the country, all over the globe. When you find a spiritually healthy church, they understand that tithing is a great opportunity for you and me to get good food, but also feed other people. So when I tithe, yes, I get blessed. It's a blessing to be a blessing, but as I tithe, God uses it to bless other people. And it's like an envelope with my address on it. I tithe. God uses it to bless other people and feed them. And then I get fed too. Let's move on. Verse 10. And try me. This is very important. Try me. This means test me. God's saying test me. Test me in this. 
says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, this is the one everybody likes, right? Right? Everybody getting excited. Verse 10, that's my favorite verse in the Bible, baby. Come on. Open up the windows of heaven, Lord, and bless it so it, whatever was empty, it be filled to overflowing. Jesus, let's go. Get me a coffee mug with Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 on it. Let's go. And that's okay because I want God to bless you, and I want God to bless me. I want God to bless our church. But I'm telling you, verse 11, this is the one. I think this is good. And I, this is God, will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he, that's the devil, will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. I don't know about you, but I, I get a little mad at the devil sometimes, and I rebuke the devil. Now, it's one thing for me to say that. It's another thing for God to rebuke the devil. So God says, tell you what, you don't even have to say anything. If you'll just tithe, give me everything, time, talent, treasure, I'll rebuke him. And this fruit of your ground, that's the fruit of the labor of your ministry at home is what that is. The fruit for you in the field, that's the fruit of your labor of your ministry outside the home. I will stop and thwart the devil in both, both areas if you'll just trust me. I don't know about you. I'll take that, verse 11, over verse 10 all day long, right? Because I know he's going to bless me. If he can rebuke the devil for keep him away from those two areas, I'm blessed, which goes in verse 12 right here. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you'll be a delightful land, a testimony to God's goodness his faithfulness, his power, his provision. That's what the church is supposed to be. People are supposed to be out there and see, and, and see us and what we do and go, wow, if we had more of that, we wouldn't have any problems out in society today. But the reason is we don't trust him with everything. And therefore, all the needs aren't being met. And then we have stuff like the government want to step up and try to step in and go, well, the church ain't going to do it, so we got to go do it. And we're going to do it our way, which is unbiblical and ungodly. And we wonder, and we get mad and put a fist, Whoa! and we sit here with all the resources we need to meet the needs of the community. Do we want to be blessed? And then I'm going to give you three truths about tithing. Let's go number one. Tithing is a test. Tithing is a test. Before I even get to there, what is tithing? Tithing's a test. What's tithing mean? It's 10%. It's 10% of the money that comes into you. Whatever direction it comes in, however it comes in, whatever jobs you have, money comes in, 10% of that would be a tithe. Okay? And it's, it's, it's the same for everybody. Right? Everybody has 10%. It's 10% across the board. It's easy math. You just take the decimal point. And you move it over one time. And if you totally don't get that, there's a calculator on your phone. <laughs> or ask your neighbor after church. And they, somebody around you knows how to do 10%, right? But did you know this? Tithing is a test that the number 10 represents testing in the Bible. Over and over and over again. Let me give you a few. The Ten Commandments. Test. The ten plagues, a test, a test against Pharaoh and his heart. Ten times the Israelites were tested in the wilderness. Ten times Daniel was tested. The ten virgins that were tested. Ten days of testing in Revelation chapter 2. I could go on and on, but I don't have time. The point is when you see ten in the Bible, it has to do with the test. And here's the test that we're looking at right now. Don't miss this. God tests you by allowing you to test him. God is testing you and has tested you and will test you by allowing you to test him. It's the only time in scripture he allows you to test him. So he's saying, if you'll trust me, you go ahead and test me on this. Go ahead and give like I told you to give. Test me that I will not open up the heavens and give you exactly what you need and rebuke the devil and you will be blessed. Just test me on that. Test me. The question is, are you willing to test him on that? 
And when we test God, when he says we can, when we test him on this, we are allowing him to prove himself as Jehovah Jireh in our life. Some of you today have not allowed him to show you he can provide for you because you won't test him in this. And so some of you that are stingy, like, like this on the wallet, like, mm-mm, on the purse, like, oh, no, you're not going to get in there. You're not allowing him to prove to you, I've got this. Test me. He tests us by allowing us to test him, what a God he is. Number two, tithing is biblical. It is biblical, guys, okay? In fact, I want to give you three things that people argue against this point. Because tithing is biblical. First one's this one. I get this one all the time, guys. Uh, well, Pastor Justin, the reason why I don't tithe is because tithing is not in the Bible. <laughs> Genesis 14, 18 through 20, which, by the way, was 500 years before the law. Genesis, 18, Genesis 28, 22, Leviticus 27, 30, Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 2, and 13 through 15. I really don't have time to go through all of these, okay? Argument number two. Here's another one. Um, Pastor Justin, I don't tithe because we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace, Pastor Justin. Well, brother, sister, you are kind of right. You are right, but you didn't finish it all out. So, so what are, if you say that, we're under grace, we're not under the law, we're under grace. So are you saying that we can do anything we want to now because we're not under the law anymore? Is that what you're saying? So let's take an example. So if we're not under the law anymore, and you take that as I don't have to do what the law says, so th- therefore, thou shalt not murder. We can just go murder people? Is that what you're saying? Oh, oh no, you don't want that to happen either. But that's under the law, though. It's under the law. We're not under the law anymore. What about covet somebody else's spouse? That's under the law. We're not under the law anymore. We don't have to do that anymore, right? And this is what happens. We start picking certain scriptures we like. Like, I like this one, but I don't like that one. And try to justify it by saying, well, it's not under the law. We're not under the law. Well, we don't have to do this anymore. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to do this anymore. We don't have to do that anymore. Here's a third one. I love this one. Pastor Justin, I see, I don't, I don't tithe because it's not in the New Testament. Okay, I need you to write this number down. 42 times it's in the New Testament. 42 times. Okay, like half the room head nod, the rest of you did not. So I got one more for you. If you say, well, tithing is not in the New Testament, we're under the law, da 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 whatever it is, okay, great. Um, let me ask you this question. If Jesus said you should tithe, would you tithe? There's some of you in here today, that's your last stand. It's your last stand. <laughs> well, Jesus didn't say it. Okay, so let's just go there. Let's just go there real quick. If Jesus said you should tithe, would you tithe? Matthew 23, 23. It's easy to remember. Just think Jordan, Jordan, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan. Okay, Matthew 23, 23. Come on, somebody. What sorrow awaits, this is Jesus talking, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees. By the way, y'all remember, we talked about we don't want to look like the Pharisees, right? Hypocrites! For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. They, they're, so they're tithing, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Now Jesus says this, you should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. So if it's, if it's not in the Bible, well, we're under grace. Yeah, this is the new covenant. This is Jesus, right? It's not in the New Testament. That one's in the New Testament. Jesus didn't say it. I mean, so what is Jesus saying here? Don't miss what he's saying. Jesus is saying, you should tithe, but don't just think because I tithe, I don't have to serve. And we have the flip, I think, in our culture today where I want to serve, but I don't want to tithe. 
Jesus is saying it's not either or, it's both and, right? It's time, talent, and treasure. Time, talent, and treasure. Time, talent, and treasure. The third thing is this. Tithing is personal. It's personal. <laughs> Y'all, I've been in ministry, I've been, pastoral, been pastoring for a little over 15 years. And I hear these two testimonies more than any other two testimonies. People that tithe will say this, I'm so blessed. And then the other one is people that don't tithe say, I can't afford to tithe. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times. People that tithe, I'm so blessed. People that don't tithe, I can't afford to tithe. Let me give you this. Maybe this will help you out. You will never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. You want to know why? Because tithing is an act of faith. So if you're waiting for some magic number to happen, you're taking faith out of the equation. Faith is no matter what my income is right now, I will put him first and I will bring my tithes and my offerings First, and he'll provide all the rest. Which is, by the way, argument number four. I can't afford to tithe. Uh, I just feel like you guys aren't getting it. You're just not getting it. Can you help me out? Can you help me out real quick? Can you help me out real quick? Is that cool? You three? And just in this general area here, face them. Thank you so much. Okay, all right. So let's just hypothetically say, that um, I, I, these, let's say I got to go away on a business trip, okay? And let's just say hypothetically, I, I don't know how long I'm going to be gone, so I want to leave them some money to look over my estate, but, but, but my, my dealings. And so I'm like, here, here guys, I'm going to give you some amount a month, a certain amount of money a month. So in this bag for you is monthly money for each one of you to have. But I want you to use 10% of that money to take care of my wife, my bride, while I'm gone, okay, I come back sometime later, and then I find that this guy, he kind of did this with my money. He hid it. And I was like, what happened? He says, oh, well, you know, she didn't really need that much money. I felt like 10, I felt like 10 percent was too much. So I moved the decimal point one more place, and I gave her 1 percent, you know. I only gave when I wanted to. You know, if I had a little extra money, I'd give it to her. But other than that, I didn't, I didn't help. I'm not helping her out, right? You go to the next guy, and he's got this money, and he's kind of put it right around his side. Kind of like, I just, I kind of gave a little bit, but man, that 10% thing. There's certain months I didn't want to give that 10%. So I might not give it all. I might give 5%. I could kind of give whatever I want, right? Because I look over, and he's, he's, given, he's given plenty. Other people are giving. Why should I give? People that have more money than me should give, right? Ooh. That convicted somebody in here. I shouldn't have to give because blank goes to our church and they give way more. They should cover all this. And then I go to this last guy. And not only did he take and give my bride 10%, he gave more than 10% for her. I come back from my business trip. Who am I the most happy with? Right here. Right? In fact, I'm going to say, yeah, thanks. You're fired. And you're fired too. And so there, right? Because you, do you want to know why? He took care of my bride. Jesus, when he, before he went on the cross, said, I'm going to leave. I'm going to come back. But until I come back, you take care of my bride. Who's the bride? The church, right? We are the church. We are to take care of the church through our tithes and our... If you need another point, Jesus in Matthew 25, he gave a parable called the parable of talents. Same thing. He had three people and he said, hey, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a bag of money, give you two bags of money. There you go. And then you are going to get five bags of money, Okay. Based on, yeah, based on their ability, based on their ability, okay? Not on where they came from, not on their last name, 
on their ability and trustworthiness. So this one gets one, gets two, and gets five. By the way, if you start off as a one-bagger in your life, you can become a five-bagger, right? We all start here. Did you know that? I started here. In fact, I had no bag. I was like, God, wouldn't give me nothing because I wasn't trustworthy at all, right? But Jesus tells this parable and says the master went away for a time. He comes back because he trusted him with this money. And this one hides it again. Look at this. He's hiding this money here. Hold that right there. He hides the money. This one doubles it. Now he's got four. He doubles it. Now he's got ten. And he says to this one right here that has four, he says, I'm going to put you in charge of many, many large organizations and things. This one, he says, I'm going to put you in charge of nations because of what you've done. Good and faithful servant. Faithful. This one, throw him out. And let me take this and give it to this one. He can't even hold all the blessing. But the reason why God gives the one who has the blessing is he knows it's going to go through his hand and go to somebody else. Right? He's just a conduit. And this one's going to graduate to this one day, right? And the problem is we get over here and we hear tithes and offerings and you hear a message about it and you get cringeworthy. Like, I don't want to hear about all that. And you just do the same thing. And you wonder why the Lord can't put something in your hand because you've got your hands behind your back holding on to whatever it is. Oh, I can't let go of this. And God's like, I would, I would love to be able to put something more in your hand. But I can't. I can't. Whose fault is that? Is it God's? Oh, why, won't, why are you blessing them and you're not blessing me? Give it for these guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> now, real quick here with the little bit of time I have left, let me, let me give you three wrong approaches. And if you say these phrases, I hear these phrases too about tithing. Number one is this. Well, I got to give, I guess. Heard that sermon today. I guess I got to give now. That's the wrong heart. That's the wrong attitude. God wants to bless a cheerful giver, right? What about this next one? Guilt to give. Where someone would stand up here and say, if you don't give, God's going to strike you down with lightning and blah, blah, blah. I hope you understand that. That's not what I'm saying today at all, at all. I'm just reading the scripture to you. It's, it's between you and the Lord, right? So don't be guilted into giving, right? The third thing is this. Well, I'm going to give, but I'm only going to give to get. Like, Lord, I'll give. I heard that sermon. I'm going to give, but I heard that blessing thing on verse 10. Oh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. If you'll open up the heavens, Lord, I'll give. But if you ain't open up the heavens, mm-mm. In fact, I need, to, I need it to open up tomorrow. So not only will I not give unless I get, I'm going to get real specific on when I need that blessing to hit. Because if you don't give it, I'm going to quit giving. Here's where we got to get. This needs to be our phrasing of the follower of Jesus. I get to give back. I get the opportunity to give back to a God who's given me everything that I have. And when I'm giving back, I'm returning back to him what's already his anyways. Because it's not mine. How about this? God doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. Like, y'all seriously, like for real, like, don't, don't get mad at me when I say this, because somebody always gets mad. I usually get an email. Don't email me. Like, like, God doesn't need your money. Do you know that? What he wants is to change your heart so that you won't be a slave to that dollar bill. Right? And then when he changes your heart, he can use your hands to bless other people. That's the problem, is all of this thing. Oh man, he's just gonna take my money. What am I gonna do? I'm not gonna. Which goes to this next point. You won't give God 10% unless you believe he owns 100%. You won't. If you don't believe he owns it all, if you don't believe the fact that you got a car, you got a, a house, you got any money in your bank account whatsoever, you got food, if you don't believe he supplied all of that, you will not give him 10%. Because you think you are the provider, not him. If he is your provider, then everything that's in your hands, you give it right back to him, freely. 
And some of you in here today are faithful tithers and givers, and you know exactly what that feels like. It's not even mine. It's like you don't even hardly see it. Hit your hand. It just boom, boom, boom. And you just, wow, this is cool. I just get to be a part of this. And others of you never see that flow happen because your hands are doing this and you're squeezing and you're choking everything out of it. And for us to do what God's called us to do, I'm telling y'all, it is not going to happen with us like this. But what would it look like if our whole church was like this? With our time, our talent, and our treasure. Now let me give you three ways we pass this test. I'm going to be quick with this. Be ready to write. Anybody want to pass the test today? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you the cheat, cheat answers, okay? Right? There's only three questions. I'm going to give you three answers. Number one, here's the answer. Put God first. Put God first in all areas of your life. Time, talent, and treasure. Matthew 6, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. He might not give you everything you want. But he'll give you everything you need if you seek him first. And when he's First in your life, tithing becomes a floor, not a ceiling. Did you know that? When he's first in your life, you get so on fire for the Lord because you see him working through you, you want to go over and above a tithe. God, how I want to give you more because you're doing something with everything I give to you. You do more than I can do by myself. In fact, when he's first in your life, here's one way to know if he's first in your life. If you were ever to have skipped tithing, for whatever, you missed it, you didn't put your check in for some reason, you got busy, whatever, you'd feel very awkward. I know some of you, you get into worship and whatever, and you forget, you, y'all, there are people who call me after church and said, I did not put my tithes and offering in, I'm, where are you at right now? I'm serious, I'm serious. But they're faithful givers, they know what God will do when we put stuff in his hands. Number two, you got to learn to wait. Learn to, oh, that's, you don't like that word, do you? There we go, learn to wait. Check out this, this, this uh, proverb here. The trustworthy person will get rich, a rich reward, but a person who wants quick riches will get into trouble. Here's the question I'd ask you. How can you be grateful for something if you didn't wait for it? Okay. I'm going to give you a piece of advice here on this, okay? And some of you are going to give me a really dirty look, okay? And I just love you to death, so don't get mad at me. But if you're having problems with waiting, it's probably because you don't have a budget. If you have a budget, and you start at the top, this is the income, this is how much is coming in. And you start listing your expenses. And if the first one is tithes and offerings, then the rest of it goes to pay all the rest of the bills. Then if something pretty and, oh, I need this or I think I need that or I want this or I want that, if it don't fit in the budget, you can say, but that won't fit in my budget, so I'm just going to say no to it. If you don't have a budget, you go, well, I mean, I've been really good lately. I mean, <laughs> If they got a new iPhone, I think I should get a new iPhone. You know what I mean? Like, and if we're not willing to wait on the Lord, are we really trusting him? Here's the third one. Everybody's favorite in the room. Here we go. Live below your means. Live below your means, right? One of my favorite parables here. I'm just going to read you a little portion of it. Mark uh, chapter 4. Jesus is actually explaining the parable, and Jesus says this. The seed that fell among the thorns represents others. They hear God's word, okay? But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. So no fruit is produced because you're worried about what's going to happen. What's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with this? Or the lure of wealth. Ooh, pretty. I got to have this. And the desire for other things that are not of the Lord. Let me put you this way. You can live below your means 
when your focus isn't on me. You can. Some of you, I know some of you heard that. You're like, I can't live below my means. I only have this much money coming in. If your focus isn't on you, you can totally live below your means if you have a budget. Now, let me end with this. This past Friday, as many of you know, was Veterans Day, and I uh, love Veterans Day. I feel so blessed to live in our country where we have an amazing military, um, people on the front lines, people who have gone before us. Many, many of you have, have family and friends who are serving now or who have served. I know I do, and I, this picture of my, my grandpa, Popest, uh, John Henry Popest, when he served in the Navy, I just thought it was a cool picture. Um, it just makes me, it gets me excited as I miss him. And I was thinking this week um, of the times when I was a little boy and I would sit on his lap. I remember his recliner at his house uh, just north of Sykeston here. And I would, sit, I would sit on his lap and he would tell me stuff. And I'd ask him about being in the Navy and being on the ship and all the stuff that he did and stuff. It was really cool. He'd always tell me cool stories. And I remember when I was little, I would hear him say stuff. And he always had little one-liners. How many people had grandpas that got one-liners, right? He'd say them one little one-liners. And I'd be like, oh, man, that's pretty good. And I remember as I got a little older, I'm like, my dad says the same thing. Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And now I realize I say the same things, right? So I'm saying the same things that I heard my dad say and I've heard my grandpa say. And I've been willing to bet my kids are probably going to end up saying some of the same stuff that I've said, right? And what the Lord convicted me on when I was looking at that picture today is that because of what he invested in, the principles he invested in, they got instilled in my father, and my father instilled principles in, into me, and that my job is to instill in my children the principles of gratitude and being generous, being thankful for what I have, but having an open hand to be generous with everything that's, that God puts in my hand. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I'm trying my best, and I hope they see that, that they see in my life that my life, I, I really don't care about me. It's all about them and the Lord. That's my life. And God has blessed me in the middle of it. I don't have a need or a want about anything. I don't even think about that. I just think about the Lord and them. And I hope they live their life like that. And I hope by them living their life like that, other people will see them live their life like that. They'll see our family and your family, and then they'll get a word from the Lord. They'll get convicted, and everybody starts tithing and offering, and we see all these needs met in our community. That's the only way it's going to work, y'all. We've got to get ourself off of ourself, focusing on us, and realizing that the Lord has called us to do something greater than what we're just focusing on right now. And so, last thing I'll say, and then I was going to pray for you. The Lord said to me, <laughs> don't forget, Justin, that when you give me 100% of your worst, I give you 100% of my best. And how quick I am to forget that. He took everything that's the worst part of me and said, I still love you. And not only do I still love you, I want to bless you. And I got a plan for you. And I got purpose for you. Even in your worst moment, I never turned away. I've always said, return to me. I'll return to you. Test me in this. And I feel like there's somebody in the room today. The Lord is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you to test him in this with your time, your talent, and your treasure. Test him in it. And don't do it because I told you to do it because it's between you and the Lord. And he said, he said to do it. Look at his word. Look what Jesus said. And when you do that, when you open your hands, say, Lord, here is everything. Here's all I got. Time, talent, treasure. Build your kingdom. Build your kingdom. Because when our heart is for him to build his kingdom, I'm telling you right now, you're walking in his will. God always does his will. And if your will is for him to build the kingdom, guess what? You're walking in his will. I guarantee you that. I can promise you that because he promised it. Right? 
Oh, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this video. I want to just, again, just reiterate how important it is for us to live a generous lifestyle. And part of that is, is our heart changing, which is the biggest part, honestly. But when our heart changes, it has to go directly to our hands because we are to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Let me pray for you. God, I just thank you so much for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are a generous God. God, I pray that you would just give us the courage and strength and faith to move forward, to trust you in every area of our life with our time, our talent, and certainly the treasure that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for watching this video. Please click subscribe. We have lots of content coming out. We'll talk to you soon.